We're going to start out in John 17 this morning. Uh, for those of you that watched my last video, uh, I had a message for you from Babylon. And I was trying to figure out why God put me in that situation. And this morning I woke up in my own house and did a little reading. And John 17 was part of my reading. And the Holy Spirit put upon my heart to look at another scripture in light of these scriptures. And hopefully there will be a message here that will be beneficial to some of us, if not all of us. But let's start in John 17, verse 1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Now, for those of you who may not be completely sold out for the gospel message, you've just heard the gospel message in a nutshell from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And in verse 5, and now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Yes, Jesus is eternal. He has been there. He was there from the beginning. Reread the first few verses of John chapter 1, the same book that we're in right now, if you don't understand that. Continuing in verse 6. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know, the, know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Hmm. That they may be one, even as we are one. There's a movement afoot nowadays called the ecumenical movement, where they think that we have to be friends with everybody, each other. There's no call out for, you shouldn't be calling people out and, just because this brother's teaching bad doctrine, you should believe, you know, take a little bit of what this one says and a little bit of that one. Now, I don't, I want you to understand, I don't think I'm 100% right, and I'm always willing to change my views if I can be shown something to change them. But I think generally, overall, I've got the flavor of it. Verse 12, while I was with them, I kept them in your name which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. I do not ask 
that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you love me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. It's a beautiful chapter. I love all scripture, but it's a very beautiful chapter. I told in my last video a story about how I have been hired by a corporation that it's very important that you buy into their culture. And I reminded most of you that the first word in culture is cult. And we have plenty of that. You know, I may have come off a little bit concerning to a couple of you, I think. Uh, a couple of you have reached out to me wondering my thoughts about the culture I was being asked to step into. And I didn't mean to be come across as concerning, but I knew God was giving me a glimpse at something so that I could see something greater normally. And this morning it came to me when I was reading over this, something greater is. There is a lot of cults out there. And a lot of them happen to be Christian. I'm not worried about the culture of this world. I don't belong to it. I am in this world, but I am not of this world. Much like Jesus told us here. And I'm not overly concerned for the people who will not listen. The word is out here and we're freely giving it at this time. For as an Amos says, there's going to come a time when there will be a famine for the hearing of the word of God. And we're not there yet, brothers and sisters. We're not quite there yet. We have laws being passed where channels like this probably will be taken down at some point. And I have no control over that. That is worldly things that I have no control over and I have no concern over. But until that time, I'm going to pro proclaim God's word as best I can. And one of the things that I did with this channel is I really try hard not to be a stumbling block, so to say. Uh, but I do present stumbling blocks. And I think... In our next reading here, we're going to go to Nehemiah chapter 8. That's where the Lord sent me this morning. Nehemiah chapter 8. Now Ezra had a regathering of the people, and people were regathered to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. 
after the uh, Babylonian captivity. Now remember, they were 70 years in Babylon. That's over three generations in Babylon. And Nehemiah goes through the people that came back and a lot of the things they brought back with them. But one of the things they, a lot of people did not bring back with them was the Hebrew tongue. Three generations in Babylon speaking a different language, much of the Hebrew tongue had been lost. Now Ezra, the scribe, well let me just read it to you, starting chapter 8 of Nehemiah, verse 1. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra, the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of the men and women, and those who could understand, and the ears of all the people who were attentive to the book of the law. I have to laugh a little bit. I got a comment on my last video. Uh, somebody said something about being 12 or 13 minutes in, and I hadn't made a point yet, so they had a shorter attention span. And I have to laugh a little bit because I saw a lot of people, uh, oh, I don't know, I scrolling some website. I don't do social media, so you'll have to forgive me, but Tic Tac or Tic Tock or something like that. And I saw a lot of people doing that at this conference, and they constantly kept scrolling their phones, and I couldn't figure out what they were doing. And I came over, and I sat down next to a fella, and I was looking, and he was given these little videos, and he kept scrolling them. And it's kind of funny. I heard a brother of mine give a exhortation here the other day and he was talking about these folks and he has them at his work brother Daniel for those of you who know know him and uh, he said something about uh, 17 videos in a minute and I think that was about right you know that's kind of what I saw at this conference uh, I guess there's a couple of websites that do that but I'm a more of a long form kind of person and it does take me a bit to get to the point. And here I am 12 minutes into the video and I really haven't made the point yet, have I? So my apologies to that brother and those of the rest of you that have the uh, want the quick attention spans, but I promise I'm getting to the point. I'm going to skip up right now and get to the point. I want you to look at verse 8 for a minute. They read from the book, from the law of God, clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. Have you ever stopped and thought about that verse and really considered it? I just gave away the uh, problem that Ezra had. Ezra had an audience of people, a broad audience of people, many of which were not familiar with the Hebrew tongue. And we're being told that most of them weren't even familiar with the Hebrew law, the books of the law of Moses. Now that presented a problem for Ezra. And it, they read from the book. These are the people that were standing up there. There were 12 people standing up there with Ezra. And they all shared a responsibility to get the people to understand what was being spoken. And in this particular version as ESV, they said clearly. Other versions say compelled them to understand, made it easier to understand. There's a lot of ways you can interpret that. And I think that's the whole point of this message is interpretations. We have many interpretations of God's Word, and some of them, I admit, are better than others. Some of them are outright blasphemous. 
there are those who, if you read from anything but a King James Bible, they're actually offended by it. Uh, there is one brother on YouTube, I believe him to be a brother, I believe him to be caught up in error, but he actually espouses that King James Version is further revelation of God's Word beyond the Greek and Hebrew. I don't know where that brother comes up with that at, but he is very open and very honest about his view that there is no other than King James is the only version you should read and it's the only version of the truth. And I find that kind of interesting since the King James didn't come out until 1611. So I guess God was hiding his word until 1611. I'm sorry, friends. I, I don't ascribe to that. There's older interpretations. Doe Rames. Uh, all kinds of them. They're all good. They're all pretty good. The older versions, I agree, have a lot going for them. Including one thing that another brother who's gone on to be with the Lord, he preaches on YouTube. He actually said it best, I think. You know, the best part about the King James Version of the Bible is that the translational errors, we're well aware of them. And I tend to read from King James Version most of the time when I have it available to me because I don't want to present myself as a stumbling block to anybody else. But I also read from the English Standard Version. And this morning I read that interpretation or that verse in New International Version. And I know a lot of people have a lot against NIV, myself included, especially the more modern NIV. But believe it or not, Nehemiah 8.8, 8, you could look it up on the internet if you don't own a copy of the NIV. It translates, I think, better than the King James and the ESV, that one verse. So what I'm saying here is that I try hard not to be a stumbling block to any of you who may be viewing. And I want the message to get out to everybody as much as possible. But I want us to consider our opinions and our views. There are lots of cults within Christianity. KJV only is one of them. There was a man named Peter Ruckman that still has a lot of traction to this day. I see his videos popping up in my feed from time to time. A lot of people like to think that Peter Ruckman was a master of the truth, and I apologize, I don't follow any one man. Uh, if you want some people that had a pretty good beat on things, I'd recommend Charles Spurgeon and people of that nature. Wesley, he was amazingly good. We're talking recently about his church, what it's turned into. The Methodist church is just a mess. But the founder of that church actually had some very good sermons and very good expositions. And I think he would be embarrassed by what that church has turned into this day. In the book of Revelation, we're told, Jesus says, come out of her, my people. I believe that's in chapter 18. You guys are going to have to read it for yourself if you want it. But Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her plagues. I think it's important that we put, a, put aside our presuppositions about people's views and what they believe. And if you're not reading this version, you're not getting the truth of God. Well, I got bad news for you. Uh, I have a lot of issues with the King James Version. I, although I enjoy reading from it, when I do read from it, I tend to point some of those out. I know I miss quite a few. There's translational issues where certain words don't translate as well into English. And Nehemiah, or, uh, in the book of Nehemiah 8.8, 8, we just saw that Ezra and the guys that were with him had a problem. They had a group of people that no longer spoke or understood the original language as it was written. So they had to translate. One of the versions says, I looked up several versions this morning. I think it was the Berean translation. that I didn't realize they had their own translation until this morning. But in the Berean Bible, I believe it was, said to translate 
for the people so that they could understand. Now, I'm not saying any version is the be-all, end-all, but I do highly recommend that we look at the original versions and we look for ourselves to see these words of God. Every word is important. And when in doubt, I hold the original Greek and Hebrew up above any other translation. Just something to points to ponder this morning. Are we being stumbling blocks? What is it in our walk that we have stumbling blocks that we are putting before other people? I know there are I have made comments to people on different platforms and I've been shouted down about different this, that, and the third. And You know, there's a lot of people that want to take their baggage and bring it to you. One of the ones that comes out to me is dual covenant theology, Seventh-day Adventism. Seventh-day Adventist, that's the oldest trick in the book. I've got a good friend of mine who's Seventh-day Adventist. And he sees a lot of the bad teaching in that. But it happens to be culturally where him and his family have been. And he's got a lot of friends in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Don't cling too tight to the doctrines of men. And cling to the Word of God is my basic message to everybody this morning. God bless you and have a good day.